I've been thinking a lot lately about how bad doctrine is. Just hearing so many people and how bad their doctrine is, how so many pastors and preachers and evangelists, just how bad their doctrine is. It's like, how did they have they studied? Have they looked into the different views on things? Or are they just parroting what everybody else is saying? So I wanted to do some lessons on sound doctrine. I believe one of the most neglected things today is doctrine. And this is going to be about the topic of lordship salvation. And I want to tell you why lordship salvation is wrong. And I'm going to give you some reasons why that they're so wrong and why that they make so many errors. One of the reasons they make so many errors is because of how they define certain terms. The lordship salvation guy has his own definition for things and it gives people the wrong idea. For example, if you ask them to define things like easy believism, they would say, what I teach is called easy believism. And I'm really okay with that label because I believe salvation is simple and in, in that it is easy to believe. So that it <clears throat> isn't the problem. The problem is how they define easy believism. Since it's a man-made term, you can't go to the Bible to get a real definition for easy believism. You can't search that in the Bible and find it. So they got to make up a definition for it. And a smart guy once said that he who defines the terms wins the argument. But their definition for easy believism is wrong. Their definition for easy believism is someone who believes with the head and not with the heart. They say if you uh, are an easy believer that you believe somebody can just believe with the head, not with the heart, and just say a prayer to get rid of a, a soul one or something, and they're saved. But that's not true. So they would say that I teach easy believism, and that I would teach that a person could just repeat a quick prayer or claim to know certain facts about the gospel and be saved just because they got, they've now got this head knowledge of the facts. And that's not true. That's not what I believe at all. But uh, uh, I think about in Acts chapter 8, remember the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, the Ethiopian eunuch sitting in his chariot, he knew the facts after Philip laid out Isaiah 53 for him. He wasn't saved yet. And he told, he told him, how is it? You know, he told him, he said, what must I do? Or he said, what does hinder me from being baptized? And remember, Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. You see, he had, he had told him how Isaiah 53 was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So now he knew the facts. But then he believed from the heart. And in Acts 8, 35 through 37, it says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. See, he knew the facts. He had the head knowledge. And he, then he believed from the heart. So he knew the facts and then he received Jesus Christ. So that's wrong if you believe and teach that a person can just simply know the gospel message and be saved. It goes beyond head knowledge, obviously. For example, I've talked to people before and they know what Jesus did. They know they're a sinner, but they say they don't want to be saved or they're not ready to be saved. You see, knowing facts does nothing to save a person. But the Lordship Salvation guy wants to make you think if you don't believe like him, then you're just an easy believist and you just believe somebody can just have head knowledge and, and still be saved, you see. And think about in Acts 26, 28, Agrippa was almost persuaded to be a Christian. You see, many times someone almost makes the choice to believe on Jesus Christ, but they never do. You see, it's more than just knowing some things in your mind. You make a decision to believe from the heart. So if easy believism is simply just knowing facts and not believing from the heart, then easy believism would be wrong. That's how the Lordship Salvation God defines it. So he wins the argument because he makes it look like you're teaching something that's a heresy. So if that's what you call easy believism, then most definitely that's wrong doctrine. But if easy believism is simply 
the belief that it is easy to believe and be saved, then it is correct. Because it is easy to believe and be saved. They may say, well, you just believe that a person can repeat a prayer and know the facts of the gospel and be saved. And that's not true. I believe in easy believism because it's easy to believe. And it says in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. It's simple. Just because it is easy to believe doesn't mean you can just know the facts and be saved. You have to make a decision to receive the Lord Jesus. You see, there are people who know the gospel, and they don't deny that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, is buried and resurrected, but they haven't believed from the heart to salvation. Salvation is about heart belief, not just knowing the facts. It even tells you in Romans 10, 9 through 10, that if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see, I knew the facts of the gospel for a long time before I got saved. But that night I got saved, I knew I was a guilty sinner. I knew I was going to hell. And I came to Jesus Christ and said, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. And I want you to save me. And that was it. I believed from the heart to salvation. The words weren't magic words that got me to the family of God. The words weren't, the words were just an out, the words I said were an outward display of what had just, what's taken place inside. You see, it's easy to believe. And how the Lordship Salvation Teacher defines the terms will usually cause him to win the argument. If someone takes everything he says as an absolute truth, he'll make you look like a heretic because, you know, he's going to call you an easy believer and say easy believers just believe you can repeat, repeat a prayer, not even be believing from the heart. So that's how they define easy believer, belie believism. Another word that they don't define correctly many times is works. You see, another definition that the Lordship Salvation teacher gets twisted is the term works. Now, he knows what good and bad works are, but there's some things that he doesn't call works for some reason. For example, if a Lordship Salvation guy is witnessing to someone, he would say to be saved, you have to turn from the sin of shacking up, committing adultery, or what, whatever sin it is, and believe the gospel. He would say you have to turn from that sin and he'll, I mean, he believes that turning in certain sins and believing in the gospel to be saved. And he does not call that works. He doesn't define that as faith and works. He says that's just faith. That doesn't make sense. Uh, that, is, that is more than just faith right there if you're teaching that gospel. And the Bible clearly says just verses like Romans 4, 5, I don't even have to quote them to you because everybody knows them, but I'm going to anyway just in case. It says in Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man into whom God imputeth righteousness without works. It has nothing to do with your works. The works before you were saved, it has nothing to do with it. The works after you're saved has nothing to do with it. Works play no part in your salvation. Even if they are good works, and the good works didn't do any favors for your salvation, any more than your bad works could do damage to your salvation. But for example now, a lordship salvation guy may be witnessing to someone who's sh uh, shacking up, and the first thing they say is, you know you're going to have to get out of this house and quit shacking up. If you're going to be saved... And you've got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, they add that work in there. Although they don't define that as a work. They, they, they won't define that as a work. The person... Now, the person who's doing the sinful stuff should quit doing that sinful lifestyle. But they do that after they have been born again. You don't, you, you don't go to them and say, to turn from all these sins before they even get saved. You know, he's dead in trespasses and sins. He's not going to be able to turn from these sins as a lost person. And you, you, when, you, when you say these things, when you're witnessing to somebody, it makes them think it's about their works. It makes them think it's about how they're living and not as much about the Lord Jesus Christ. And just because they're born again 
it, just because you get them saved and they're born again doesn't automatically mean they will stop with the sinful lifestyle. And now you have the Lordship Salvation guy who may not take it as far as the, the ones I was just telling you about, but they still have the works on the opposite end of salvation. You know, he may not teach you how to quit anything to get saved, but he would teach that if you have that if you haven't quit certain sins, that your salvation never happened. Or if you haven't stopped certain sins, then your salvation never even existed and that you were just lost this whole time. Now, the thing is, they don't define this as faith plus works. They say it's just faith. But it is faith plus works. They say salvation is by grace through faith and the works just show your faith. Now, obviously, when a saint does any genuine, sincere work for Jesus Christ, it is because they have the Holy Spirit and they're yielding to the Holy Spirit. But to say that if a person doesn't have good works or doesn't have a changed lifestyle or have, have not stopped bad sins in their life, that they're not saved, that is false and you are subtly requiring works. And whether or not you want to define that as adding works, it makes no difference if you want to define that as works or not. You're adding works. You're not, uh, you, you mess up the term works because you won't call it what it is. You see, living a life that is becoming of a Christian, that is, doing works meet for repentance, doing good works that match somebody who you would think is a Christian, that is good works. That's why it's called works meet for repentance. And you ought to do that. But you can't say that that's required to prove you're saved. It is definitely sound doctrine to teach that we should do works meet for repentance and to maintain good works and put off the old man. It's when you say that that is a requirement to being saved, that's where you mess up. It isn't the same as teaching you can lose your salvation, but it's a close cousin. It's a close cousin to teaching you can lose your salvation because you're making the saint lose his assurance. You make a saint lose his assurance. Anytime you say that a changed life is required for a person to be saved, you automatically force your congregation or the people you're preaching or teaching to to look at their works and examine their life of works to determine if they're saved or not and not to look at the moment they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Anytime, anytime you say that a, that a changed life is required for salvation, you make that person look at their lifestyle how they're living at that current moment. And they're going to use that to determine if they're saved or not. You're making it about their works. And if you don't want to say you're making it about works, you're just not looking at it right. You don't look at, uh, you don't see the word works and call it what it is. You just want to call it faith when you're adding works. But the verses are so clear. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Do you know why I'm saved? Not because I cleaned up my mouth. Do you know how I know I'm saved? It's not because I cleaned up my mouth. Not because I dumped my rock music. Not because I quit hanging with the wrong people. But because I have a spot. And I learned that phrase from my pastor, Make sure you have a spot. And what that means is make sure there was a time when you knew you were a sinner and you believed from the heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever somebody says, are you saved? I remember that moment. You may not remember the place or the time or the date, but you remember that moment, that little spot in your mind where you knew you were a sinner and you came to Jesus Christ as a gifted sinner and you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember I was in my room I was 21 years old, and I believed from the heart. That's my spot. And so if the devil wants to come to me and say, you're not saved because you just did this or that, or he'll say, after you've seen a real believer doesn't act that way and make you want to lose assurance of salvation, you see, I don't base my salvation off that. I remind him that I have a spot. There was a day... When I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, there was a moment I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and I've been saved ever since because at that time I was born spiritually into the family of God. And you have a spot if you've been saved. 
and it's the blood of the Lord Jesus. It washed away my sins away in the past, present, and in the future. When I first got saved, I remember giving my testimony, and I would say, I know I'm saved because I have a changed life. And I said that because I heard other people say it when they gave testimonies. But then when I just started studying the Bible, looking about salvation more, that's the wrong answer. You don't, You shouldn't know you're saved because of a changed life. You should know you're saved because of that night, that day, that moment, you came to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believed on the Lord from the heart. That's your spot. That's the spot. If there's a timeline on your life that God sees, there's a spot on there marked with the blood of Jesus and you were born into the family of God. And the works you did before that have nothing to do with it. The works you do after that have nothing to do with it. And anytime you say the evidence of salvation is how you're living, at the current moment, or how you've been living, you unknowingly, the, I believe these people unknowingly most times, subtly add works to salvation because you force people into thinking how their living plays a part in their salvation. And they're going to look at their own works instead of looking at the Lord Jesus Christ who did all the work for them. You take the emphasis off Jesus Christ and you put the emphasis on their conduct, whether you mean to or not. And you have to remember the people you're preaching or teaching to usually don't know anything about the Bible. They don't know anything about salvation. They're very impressionable and you have a huge responsibility to show them the right way, to show them the right doctrine. You can force that person to lose assurance and possibly never get it back because there's never going to be a time when they're living good enough to even prove they're saved. They could do works meet for repentance, but they're always gonna, there's always going to be sin because they got this flesh you see a change life requirement <clears throat> adds works and it doesn't work because a saint may have their life cleaned up today doing most things right no pet sins they're reading their bible they're going to church they're praying and everything else. And you would look at that saint and say, wow, he's truly been born again. Look at his works that are meat for a penance. That guy may go, that same guy that was doing all this good stuff, he was doing good stuff in your town. Everybody thought he was saved because they was looking at his works to prove he was saved. He could go to another town, get backslid and yield to the flesh. And the local pastor in that town sees him and think, wow, I have a burden for him. There ain't no way he's saved acting like that. See the inconsistency? Your salvation stays. It never goes away. Your standing in Jesus Christ never changes. It never fluctuates. You're always seen as righteous as Jesus Christ to the Lord. But your state is something else. Your state is how men see you. And if you're not maintaining good works, then you just look like a lost person. And the local pastor had never seen this same guy living a changed life like he was in the other town. So the other pastor in the other town believes that he's saved. He has a changed life. This guy's never seen him living that way. He's never seen him living a holy lifestyle. So if the, if the pastor believes a changed lifestyle and a holy lifestyle is required to be saved or determines your salvation, then he's going to say, well, this guy's lost. And that's the final answer. But what about the changed life he had back in the other town? You see? To go around and determine whether someone is saved based on how they're currently living is a bad way to determine their salvation because you can't be with them 24 hours a day in their entire life to see if they ever had the amount of fruit you think a person ought to have to be truly born again. If you want to know if they're saved, then you have to go by their testimony. If they claim to be saved, they give you the right testimony and they're living no different than a lost person would, then you would keep from fellowshipping with them just as if he was a lost person. I mean, Paul tells you in verses like 1 Corinthians 5.11, he says, But now have I written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, which such an one know not to eat. You see, you're not supposed to fellowship with a worldly Christian any more than you would a lost person. And Lordship Salvation guys will many times 
not define call works when it's works. They don't define it right. Another thing they don't define right is repentance. They will get repentance wrong so many times, mess it up very badly. So the Lordship Salvation guys, most times, get the word repentance wrong. And of course you repent when you get saved. That's another thing. They'll say you don't believe in repentance. And that's not true either. We just don't believe in how they define the word repentance. For example, they would say that repentance unto salvation means to quit sinning to get saved. You quit sinning before you get saved. And and they don't mean to be sinlessly perfect, but, you know, cleaning up a certain sin or cleaning up one's lifestyle. Or they'll say something like, if the person truly got saved, then they will quit doing a certain sin or clean up their lifestyle and live a certain lifestyle that meets their standards or whatever. And that's not necessarily true, but they'll say if the person doesn't, then that person didn't truly repent so do you think it means do you think repentance means to turn from sins plural to be saved if so that's wrong uh, you can't quit all of your sins and you never turn from all your sins even after you're saved and listen your flesh your sinful flesh does not get born again so most likely the same sins that you struggled with before you were saved are the ones you're going to be tempted with the most. For example, imagine uh, a drug you get saved. Does the drugs leave his flesh after he got saved? No, it's going to be a process. An alcoholic, he's still going to crave alcohol. A fornicator, still going to crave maybe buying prostitutes, something like that. Um, your flesh doesn't get born again. You can't confess all your sins to be saved. You don't even know them all. If that is how you define repent and be saved, then you have it wrong. Now, if you say repent and believe the gospel, and by saying repent you mean change your mind, then that's correct. And the Lordship Salvation guys many times hate it when you say that repentance means a change of mind. They absolutely hate that. But notice the first time the word's used. Genesis 6, 6. It says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So the Lord repents, but it has nothing to do with him turning from sins because obviously the Lord cannot sin. So what do you change your mind about when you got saved? You change your mind about yourself. I mean, automatically. You didn't even... You may not even thought about that before, but you changed your mind about yourself when you got saved. When you got saved, you were realizing you were a sinner that wasn't good enough to save yourself. And many times someone can think they're living a good enough life to make it to heaven. And that's wrong. But then they realize they're a sinner. They realize their guilt of sin and that they're going to go to hell. They change, their mind was changed about their self. And it's, it's a given when you get saved, you realize your own righteousness is not any good. It can't save you. You see, because when you believe the gospel, the gospel is Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. So by knowing the gospel and believing the gospel, you, you're admitting without even, you don't even have to, maybe not even said it, but you're admitting that you're a sinner and you're also admitting that you need a Savior. So by admitting you're a sinner and admitting you need a Savior, that automatically shows that uh, you changed your mind about your own self-righteousness. You see, when you got saved, you changed your mind about any type of false god or person or religion or place or thing that you might have thought would save you, and you turned to Jesus Christ. You turn to the Lord and realized He is the way, the truth, and the life, as John 14, 6 says. Now, that doesn't mean that you may not have went back and 
Like, for example, somebody that was of a certain, uh, or somebody that was like a Catholic, and they was relying on all these works to save them, uh, they could have got genuinely saved because they, they knew they was a sinner. They knew that they was going to hell. They, they knew that their own self-righteousness couldn't get them to heaven, and they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't necessarily mean that they wouldn't uh, go back to the Catholic Church just out of fear of family or friends even. You see, when you got saved, you changed your mind about anything that would save you outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. You realize He's the Savior. And in Acts 20:21 20, it says, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There, You see, there it is. You repent towards God. You was going one way down this road, maybe relying on your own self-righteousness, maybe relying on another God. Somebody showed you the gospel, showed you you can't save yourself. You did a complete 180, and you, you, you stopped relying on your own righteousness. You stopped relying on that false God to save you, and you turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there is repenting in the Bible that has to do with repentance unto salvation, meaning you repented when you got saved, and that was the repentance, that, repentance I just explained to you. But there is also a repentance in the Bible that is turning from sins, and that's something you do after you get saved. For example, when I got saved, I repented. I changed my mind about my own righteousness. I changed my mind about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I came to Him as the guilty sin that I was. But then after I'm saved, when I got sins in my life, I need to repent of those sins, as in quit doing them, turn from them. But that's not what saves me, you see? So there is repenting in the Bible that has to do with turning from sins, but that is not the repentance unto salvation, or the repentance unto life, as it talks about in Acts 8, 11, 18. It says, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So when a sinner quits trusting himself, realizes his guilt of sin, and turns to Jesus Christ as the true Savior, he has repented. Whether or not he can even define the word repentance or not. Whether or not he realizes it, he just uh, repented. When someone believes the gospel from the heart... He has repented. You see, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. You see, when a man believes the gospel, he's admitting that he needs a Savior. He's admitting he can't save himself. Now, after he gets saved, he may get so... Uh, he, he may get so righteous living and start thinking that he is good and starts being self-righteous. But that doesn't mean that he's not saved. That doesn't mean he's not saved if he lived a life of self-righteousness, being a Pharisee or something. 1 Corinthians fifteen three it says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. When a man believes the gospel, he's admitting he's a sinner. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So when a man believes the gospel, he is admitting that Jesus Christ is the only way. And that he is who he says he is. You see, if you, if you have come to the Lord and believed from the heart the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, then you have repented and you're saved. You are going towards hell, trusting in the wrong thing. You realized your guilt of sin and started trusting in the right thing and you got saved. It wasn't about turning from sins, plural, to be saved. You could say it was turning from sin to be saved because the only sin you can turn from to be saved is unbelief. You, you started believing. You turned from unbelief to belief. You were living in the sin of not believing. But you turned from that and received the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you could say, turn from sin to be saved, but it has to be a sin of unbelief. It can't be turned from sins, as in all these wicked things you're doing, you got to stop those to be saved, or you got to stop them after you're saved to be saved. 
that that stuff is a completely separate issue. So the Lordship Salvation Teacher makes an error many times with how he defines all of these terms. Easy believism, repentance, works, and he'll use his these false definitions for his favor. Like the smart guy said one time, he said, He who defines the terms wins the argument. And if you define the terms to where it suits what you're teaching and not what you should actually define them as, or you slander the enemy by saying, well, he believes this or that, when they don't really believe that, then you make yourself win the argument. In the eyes of the people that don't know no better, that is. So the, the first error is how they define the terms. Another error is how they cross themselves. You see, the Lordship Salvation guys will constantly constantly cross themselves, double speak, speak out of both sides of their mouth, be very uh, hypocritical with what they're saying. One minute they'll say this, another minute they'll say that. That's because the teaching is a, this is a very inconsistent false teaching. Paul, the Apostle Paul, read Romans through Philemon, lays out salvation so clear. And he is where you primarily go to get your doctrine today. Although we aren't limited to his epistles for doctrine. But he lays it out so clearly for us. But the Lordship guys don't have a good enough handle on Paul. Uh, they want to try and mix things from Matthew and Acts and Hebrews, the transition books, just like the Church of Christ will do, just like all these other uh, false groups will do. They want to take things from those books and mix it in with Paul's epistles when most times those are talking to two completely different dispensations they fail to rightly divide the scriptures and this makes them unstable they're very unstable with what they say they will toss you to and fro one sunday they'll say this the next sunday they'll say that and you're left wondering well is this right or is that right and you're just left confused very confused and one one a sermon they may say you're saved by grace through faith without works and and they may say a Christian can backslide or get away from the Lord. And the next minute they're saying you're saved by grace through faith, but if you're not living it, then you didn't really get saved. Now, how does that make sense? One minute they're saying you're saved by grace through faith without works and then talk about a, a Christian who's possibly backslid or got away from the Lord. Then the next sermon comes around and they're saying if you're saved by grace through faith, but if you're not living right, you didn't really get it. If you're living this certain lifestyle, then you really didn't get saved. Now, how does that make sense? You can be backslid, not right with the Lord, but if you're not living it, then you didn't get saved. That's saying two completely different things. And if if they got some way to explain that, why they say that, then okay. But you got to understand you're confusing everybody. Everybody's confused about what you actually believe. It says in 2 Peter three fifteen through 16 An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Talking about Paul's epistles. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. You see, just like a, a false uh, group or denomination or cult will take the scriptures and they don't understand it and they're unlearned and they're unstable, they, it leads to their own destruction. The Lordship Salvation guys will take the Bible. They'll use the Bible. They don't understand what they're even talking about. And they'll lead people to their own destruction. And they're, because they're so unstable. They're unlearned and unstable. And they rest the scriptures into their own destruction. For example, I've heard evangelists get up and say, If you don't love coming to church, then I doubt you're saved. I would hate to go to church if he was my pastor. Why would you enjoy listening to somebody who doesn't even understand salvation? That's that show that's a that is a novice. Somebody that would say something that stupid. That is stupid. Imagine if an evangelist 
was going around telling you what you need to do to go to heaven when he doesn't even understand salvation himself. That shows he has a, a great lack of understanding about what even took place at your salvation, about what salvation even is. It's stupid. Or, for example, I heard a guy, another evangelist, he said one time, he says, if somebody's got to prime you to shout, you're probably not saved. That is a very stupid thing. Stupid thing to say. They teach that someone without a changed life or who isn't showing enough works is lost, correct? But then they use phrases that hint that they deep down inside don't believe that. What they're saying sometimes shows that they deep down don't even believe the Lordship salvation stuff themselves. They talk because they talk about someone who is getting away from the Lord. They got they'll say they got away from the Lord or they got backslidden. That contradicts what you're saying most times. Because if he's gotten away from the Lord, just how far are you allowing him to get to still consider him to be saved? Just like you ask somebody who doesn't who who believes uh, that you can lose your salvation, you can ask them, "Well, which sins will make me lose my salvation?" Or which or, or how deep, just deep can I get before I end up losing my salvation? They can't give you a real answer. Just like these guys can't give you a real answer. You see, if somebody's getting away from the Lord, then wouldn't that prove that a believer will not always show a changed life? And many times you can, by chance, meet a person. You can meet a person while their state is actually away from the Lord. They've got away from the Lord. Maybe you never met this person before. Say you started a new job. You're meeting this person for the first time. Maybe they're cussing. They're not talking about the Bible. They're not talking about going to church because they're not going. And you might even think that they're not even a believer. But they, you find out you, that they were actually saved. And you say, well, he would have to show works at some point in his Christian life to truly be saved. Well, how do you know that he didn't show works at one point? Years before you met him. Or how do you know that he won't show works eventually when he grows? You know, the Bible talks about babes in Christ. It talks about the carnal Corinthian church. I mean, there's, there's Christians that are carnal. The fact that Paul t uh, talks to Corinthians like they're saved people, yet calls them carnal, shows you that not everybody's living a changed life. I mean, what Bible are you reading? How are you preaching when you don't know? How are you teaching somebody about salvation when you don't even know this stuff? You say, well, he would have to show works at some point in his Christian life for me to say that he's saved. All I'm saying is, using a changed life to determine whether someone is saved or not saved is a very inconsistent way to determine someone's salvation. Because the Lordship Salvation guy will tell people that they aren't saved if they still have a certain sin in their life in, in one message. And then in another message, he'll talk about someone getting away from the Lord or even backslidden. And get up and preach about they'll even have sermons where they get up and preach about getting a certain sin out of your life well if they've got a certain sin in their life wouldn't that to if your lordship salvation guy wouldn't that prove to you that they're not saved according to your teaching it's because deep down they know that christians still could live a sinful lifestyle but at the same time they want to uh, preach this false lordship salvation doctrine you see, um, get away, getting away from the Lord or even backslidden, if you preach those things, how can you preach the Lordship salvation stuff at the same time? It makes you look like you're, un, you're uncertain yourself. You're confused yourself. You see, um, wouldn't it be pointless for you, if you're a Lordship salvation guy, wouldn't it be pointless for you to get up and tell a bunch of Christians that they really got to get this sin out of their life? When you think that a, a Christian isn't going to live a sinful lifestyle? Just like it would be pointless to go soul winning if you believed in Calvinism. Because you believe, well, he's going to get saved anyway. You know, why should I go soul winning? Because you think he's going to get saved anyway if you're a Calvinist. It's similar to that. And since the sinner, according to the Calvinist, is going to be saved anyway, you know, why give him the gospel? 
according to them. You know, the same way you had a free will to get saved, you have a free will to either live for the Lord after you're saved or not live for the Lord after you're saved. Consider how they say that every born-again believer will have a changed life and will eventually have works. And they'll say, if you're truly born again, if you're really saved, you're going to have works. But yet, what about when he teaches on the judgment seat of Christ? It winds up in double speak again if he even teaches on judgment seat of Christ. Most of them probably don't because they probably don't even know what that is. But I've heard uh, Lordship Salvation guys, they'll teach on judgment seat of Christ. But yet, though, in, in another message, they'll... Uh, teach the Lordship Salvation stuff. And how does that not make sense? Well, he'll talk about saints who get rewards because they, they had good Christian service. But then at the same time, they'll talk about you possibly not even getting rewards because of your lack of Christian service. And that's true. But wouldn't that prove that not all Christians are living a sanctified life because they're getting to the judgment seat of Christ and not getting anything? You know, there's it's it's a sinful it's it's a sinful lifestyle to go through life and not know not doing what you know to be good. The Bible says, "To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin." And if you go through your Christian life and never do anything that you know, never pray, never read your Bible, maybe you go to church every time the doors is open, you got a good moral life, you don't drink, you don't shack up, you don't do all these things that the the sins that the Lordship Salvation guys name off, but yet you really don't do anything, period. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. That's a sinful lifestyle, and you're going to get to the judgment seat of Christ and not have any rewards. The fact that Christians get to the judgment seat of Christ and don't get any rewards proves that, it, that not every Christian is going to live it. I mean, that how do you... Teach or preach on judgment seat of Christ, and at this and one Sunday, and then the next Sunday you're teaching lordship salvation stuff. The truth is, there are people who are going to show up at judgment seat of Christ, won't get anything because they live like a lost person their whole Christian life. They live like a practical atheist. They claim to know God, but lived as if there wasn't one. And if they are truly, they are. Tr you see, they are truly saved. Because they came to the Lord Jesus as a guilty sinner and believed on Him to save them. But they, they either didn't grow, they didn't try, they didn't yield to the Spirit, they just yielded to the flesh their whole life. So, the Lordship Salvation guys, they got errors in how they define things. They got errors in how they just constantly double-cross themselves. They say one thing this Sunday, they say one thing the next Sunday. It's very inconsistent, it confuses everybody. Especially people who's listening who don't know much about the Bible. You're destroying that person. If he's saved, you're destroying his, his assurance. You're making him think that, well, maybe I'm not saved because I did this. Maybe I'm not saved because I've done that. If he's lost, you're making it think that his works plays a part. You see, you're destroying people. You have a responsibility. Learn the Bible. All you want to do is go around and and uh, look like a big shot all the time. Most of these guys do that. I see preaching this. They just go around looking like a big shot everywhere. It's disgusting. And they don't care they don't care anything about doctrine. They never even talk about doctrine. It's a sin not to know doctrine. It's, and then the next thing is, it's another error, is how they come up with this big list of standards, their own personal standards that you got to go by in order for them to say, well, yeah, that guy's saved. Or he's, he's not got this, so he's not saved. They become the judge. They become the one who determines if you're saved or not by how you're living, by looking at you in the flesh. How stupid. Um, they come up with this big list of standards. For example, they may say, you're, you can't be saved if you've done this or that. They single out certain sins. You can't single out certain sins in somebody's life to determine if they've been saved or not. To name a few of the big ones that they'll use, and it's the same ones that the people who teach you can lose your salvation will use most times. Sins like, it's this, the big sins that everybody can see, that so looked down on in society. And obviously these are sins that you shouldn't be doing. But it's sins like shacking up. 
you know, they'll say, well, he, he's not saved. He's shacking up. I had a guy stood in my driveway talking about somebody he was witnessing to next door and said they can't be saved because they're shacking up. I mean, I thought the next thing he's going to tell me, my other neighbor over here isn't saved because there's no way that he would let his grass get that high if he was saved. I mean, really, he's got a lawnmower. If he's really saved, he's going to mow his yard. How stupid. Uh, they, they, they'll say, if you're shacking up, you're not saved. You're drinking alcohol, you're not saved. Smoking weed, you're not saved. Living in adultery, you're not saved. Homosexuality, you're not saved. Any sin. And they say, if you do these things as a lifestyle then there's no way you could be born again. Now, I'm not saying you should do these things. Obviously, you need to get the sin out of your life. That's obvious. And so don't come with this stuff saying, oh, you believe you can just live however you want. That's stupid. And that's the same exact thing that the people who say you can lose your salvation, that's the same thing they say. They say, well, you, you believe once saved, always saved. You believe you can just live however you want to. I don't think I've ever said that. I've never said that ever in my entire life. I've never heard any Bible believer say that. So they say if you do these things, at least, maybe even, they might just say if you do these things and that's your lifestyle. They may think, some of them may think, well, you can mess up and commit certain sins, but you couldn't do these things as a lifestyle. And that's not, that's not true either because a Christian can give into the flesh and do what the flesh wants. You understand? But they basically have a list of sins that are possible for a Christian if he's, Truly saved, as they say, to truly born again, that he won't commit these sins on the list. And they got a list of sins that aren't, that they got a list of sins that aren't possible to, to, in their eyes, still be considered a saint if you commit those sins. And this puts that person as the judge on who is saved or not. This puts that person, it puts him up there pretty high. I mean, it, um, it's it's very Pharisee like. So, they got a list of standards. The next thing to do is they they just can't understand. They cannot get it through their skull. The difference between salvation and discipleship. If you teach this, open your ears and listen. If you teach the Lordship salvation stuff, listen. You see, the Lordship Salvation guy consistently connects salvation with discipleship. Salvation and discipleship are two different issues entirely. Because a man can be saved and not be a disciple. A man could pretend to be a disciple and have good works and not even be saved. Uh, when a man realizes his guilt of sin... And comes to Jesus Christ and believes on him. His death, his blood, and resurrection. Then that is salvation. When he starts reading his Bible, having a prayer life, quitting pet sins, and gets baptized, that stuff is discipleship. Listen, you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's salvation. You, got, you started reading the Bible, praying, quitting pet sins. You got baptized. That's your discipleship. The reading the Bible, praying, and quitting your pet sins and getting baptized have nothing to do with salvation. And you know that. You, you obviously know that deep down. You just... His salvation, you see, was eternally settled before he did any of that stuff. And those things had no effect on his salvation, either for keeping it or losing it. And so, salvation and discipleship are two different issues entirely. And of course, every Christian needs to have good works. That's very clear. In Acts twenty six twenty, it says to do works and meet for repentance. Do works that would match somebody that claims to be a Christian. If you claim to be a Christian, then do then do the works that would m match what somebody would expect out of a Christian. Have good works. It says in Titus 3.8 uh, that you need to maintain good works. But the Lordship Salvation guy forgets. He forgets that you can yield to the Spirit or you can yield to the flesh. If you get up every day and you die, you got to die daily as Paul talks about. If you die daily, every day you get up and yield to the Spirit, you're going to show works meet for repentance. You're going to 
show people. You're going to show your salvation outwardly. But just because you've got good works doesn't mean you're saved. And just because you don't got good works doesn't mean you're not saved. It all comes down to, was there a time when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the determining factor. Not how you're living today. Not how you lived 10 years ago. Not how you're going to be living 10 years from now. But the Lordship salvation, God forgets, you can yield to the Spirit or you can yield to the flesh. Romans six eleven through 14, it says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead and deed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. How could, you know, why would Paul, Paul say to let not sin reign in your mortal body? Why would he say that? If you couldn't let it rain. If sin is raining in your mortal body, you're obviously not showing a changed life, right? If it's impossible for a Christian to let sin reign in his mortal body, then why would Paul say this? It's, he says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness. You can yield yourself to the flesh, the world, and the devil and do unrighteous things. And like I said, the temptations you're going to be tempted with is this, most likely the things your flesh liked before you were saved. But he says, But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. If you yield your members to God and not to unrighteousness, then you're going to do works that match what a Christian ought to have. In Romans 6, 15, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. You know, should you go out and do what you want to do? Just because you're saved? Absolutely not. You should do works that matches someone who professes to be a Christian. You should do works that matches someone who professes to be a Christian. In Romans 6, 16, it says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. You can yield, either yield yourself to God or the flesh or the world or the devil. You know, you got a free will to still make bad decisions. But the bad decisions are going to lead to bad things. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Nobody's saying you should go out and live how you want to. Just however your flesh wants to. You should do right. But those things aren't what saves you. In Romans six seventeen through 19, it says, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. You obeyed from the heart, being then made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For He says, because of the infirmity of your flesh. Your flesh is bad. It's not born again. Your flesh is evil. You don't realize how... how e it, your flesh is just as evil as it was before you were saved. It's capable of committing any sin in the Bible. Paul even says in Galatians... Um, re to restore each other in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You're going around saying these people aren't saved because they're committing these sins that you haven't committed. You better be careful because you need to consider yourself lest you also be tempted yourself. And it's it's a true thing. You can be so repulsed. You can be so right with God and in the Bible and in, in your prayer life and going to church and so repulsed and, and just abhorring certain sins. But then you, over time, the devil slowly creeps in, gets you away from God little by little, little by little. And you end up doing a sin you never thought you would commit that you never even had a taste for before in your flesh, and all that time you're accusing the people who committed that sin to not truly be saved, you need to consider yourself lest you also be tempted. He says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. If you couldn't yield yourself to iniquity, then why is Paul telling you to yield your members, servants, to righteousness and holiness? Why would he tell you to do these things if there's not an option? 
Because you can yield to the flesh. As a Christian, you can yield to the flesh and end up doing just like you did as a lost person. It's possible for you to commit any sin as a saved person. You have to watch out. It says in Romans 6.20, For when for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. See, now you're free from sin. You're not you're not your your soul's not connected to your flesh no more. You don't have to serve the flesh. You don't have to. You got an option. And you obviously none of us are going to be sinlessly perfect. But it's like this, take each temptation at a time. Take each sin as it presents itself to you at a time. Don't think too far ahead into the future when you see you got a temptation coming at you right now. Go ahead and take the sword out. And slice it in half right now. Get rid of that temptation. Then be ready for the next temptation. Here it comes. Take the sword and and slice it. You don't have to you, you don't have to serve sin. You see, the flesh is dead. And if you serve the flesh, you're serving a dead corpse. So each time it wants to get up out of the grave, you take your sword and you swat it back in the grave. You take a sword and you put it back on the cross. But uh, this is the teaching against lordship salvation. So here's what I believe. If you want to be saved, come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner that you are. You realize you can't save yourself. You realize you're going to go to hell if you don't get saved. And you come to Jesus who died on the cross for your sins, shed his blood, he was buried and resurrected, and all you've got to do to be saved is come to him right now. The Bible says in Romans ten thirteen, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just like I did that night when I got saved. I said, God, I knew I'm a sinner. I know I'm going to hell. And I, uh, I want to believe on you and be saved. And that I've been saved ever since that moment. And then you get into all these arguments about, well, do you got to pray a prayer? Do you, what if you don't pray a prayer? And you got people arguing back and forth about that. Don't complicate it. There's no magic word to be saved. You believe from the heart. And anything that you do visibly that you do on the outside is just an outward showing of, of what took place inside. It's, out, it's an outward showing of what's going on inside your heart at the time. 